go. Hey guys, welcome back to the MindMate podcast. Uh, this is going to be a solo show today. I've just got the uh, internal room set up rocking. And uh, I wanted to talk today about something that comes up a lot um, in, in counseling in, uh, in my work with, with clients. And, you know, I, I was going to start the show by, by talking about the big A word addiction. And, uh, you know, if you're watching the show, you can probably see my face light up there because it's, it's, it's such a broad concept. Um, but the word addiction, I don't know, there's so much baggage around it, right? And I think we need to understand it a little bit deeper so we can actually harness um, what it means, uh, you know, for ourselves, you know, in our own lives and all this sort of stuff. And I think most of us are starting to recognize now that addiction isn't necessarily a, a black or white thing. It's not purely yin and yang. It's a spectrum and it comes in many names and forms and labels. And um, people can be addicted to a whole variety of things, you know. Uh, the past couple of books that I've read, I've, I've uh I did a show about this one. This is Addicted by Matt Noffs and Kieran Palmer, which are friends of mine now, which is awesome. And uh, and and I did a little – I alluded to um, The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle because he actually speaks about uh, addiction in, the, in a similar vein. It's important for us to understand if, you know, whether or not we are addicted to something. So what I mean by that is – is this person behavior habit, do we have control over it? Can we say yes or no to it? And if not, if, if we feel like it is controlling us, to observe that a little bit deeper and start having to think about why that might be the case. So this is, part, this is page 63 from Addicted. And I wanted to read it to you because it's interesting and this is something that we are going to talk about today. To come full circle, relationships comes up a lot in, in the counseling world. And I wanted to uh, show you perhaps the difference between a, a meaningful, fulfilling relationship, the ones the ones that are probably going to last uh, and the ones that are more um, scarce, addictive, fear-based, um, whether the individual is actually even aware of that or not, and, and what we can do as individuals and couples to transcend though the, the latter. So have a listen to this, right? So individuals in the early stage of intense romantic love show many symptoms of substance and non-substance or behavioral addictions including euphoria, craving, tolerance, emotional and physical dependence, withdrawal and relapse. Romantic love is a natural and often positive addiction that evolved from mammalian antecedents uh, by 4 million years ago as a survival mechanism to encourage hominian pair bonding and reproduction seen cross-culturally today in Homo sapiens. So then the boys continue and say, so perhaps addiction isn't simply a negative and problematic state to be in. Perhaps addicts are not simply rats caught in cages, and maybe we are on the cusp of a new understanding of addiction altogether. So I wanted to talk about that because, A, I think it's worthwhile us no longer moving, you know, falling into that shaming addiction is bad mindset that really started over 100 years ago um, in in in. In, in the US by a man named Harry Anslinger, which is someone I'm just reading about now in Johan Hari's book, Chasing the Screen. And he was a man who was considered racist in the 1930s, to give you an idea as to how racist he was. But this whole war on drugs idea, the idea that it's, it's drugs themselves that are the issue, and, you know, if you are susceptible and you, you become addicted to these drugs or these issues, you know, these guys are talking about something as intangible as love being a potential addiction, you know, but if it's the drug's fault, then the people who use the drugs are bad and we should shame them. We should try to get rid of drugs. But if the addictive mechanisms actually are within us, in our DNA, in our evolutionary structure, then it isn't necessarily the drugs themselves, moreover, the, you know, the individuals. And, and then the next question is, why are we getting addicted to things? Okay, what's going on in our lives that, that makes it so that that person, that behavior, et cetera, um, is so important and absolutely addictive because, you know, there were soldiers who were heavily addicted to heroin uh, in the Vietnam War. And when they came back, 
they stopped using heroin. So what was heroin doing? What, how it was helping them? It was, it was helping them remove themselves from a state of unbearable consciousness. Um, and obviously when you're in the present, you're truly in the present amidst a war that can be very, very, very difficult to tolerate. So that kind of brings me to my, to my next thing, which is the discussion of addiction. You know, we are wired from an evolutionary perspective to run to pleasure and to run away from pain because our biology is set up to survive. You know, we can go into really, really a heap amount of detail with this sort of thing, but we don't need to. (laughs) So from that point of view, it becomes, okay, how are we seeing the world unconsciously? Because a lot of this is going on, um, you know, whether we like it or not. Um, How are we seeing the world as a place within which to survive? And just that perspective is going to give you a a really interesting insight into why you do what you do, okay? Because oftentimes people say things like, oh, I'm not hungry, but I eat all the time. You know, or I, 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 you know, I watch too much porn or I, I, I smoke weed all the time. When you're a human being, <laughs> you are always from a biological perspective. Now we can transcend that and do what's right for us to achieve our goals and all this sort of thing. But we are wired to move from negative emotion to positive emotion. And more often than not, I think that the major issue that we have a tough time with in this day and age is boredom. Boredom is the thing that is just getting at us. It's why we we behave in the ways we do. It's why we can't bear to be with ourselves because we haven't practiced being bored. You know, there is so much truth, uh, wonder, um, personal growth that comes from just being bored. And very quickly, you start to realize that, if I sit alone, what I'm actually doing is befriending myself. I'm learning more about who I am. You know, I'm growing because the only way to get to know yourself is to spend time with yourself. So just fighting against that itch to medicate and distract yourself and numb the, the pain that boredom brings um, can be can be really, really powerful. But more often than not, I think boredom is the killer. And this is why we engage in these habitual um, behaviors. And now, you know, with the whole virus and many of us are having to spend so much time indoors, it's a really good test for us to see how well we can transcend that boredom. And if we can't, trying to bring consciousness to that. So one of the things I say to my clients is, you know, if you're really struggling with this, let's just say, for example, you eat too much um, after dinner, you snack because it's Netflix time and you just go on. Try not to shame yourself for it because shaming puts you into that negative spiraling state of emotion. And because you're in that pain, you just want to bring yourself right out of it into the positivity. So the best thing to do is to medicate yourself with more food straight away. It's a quick quick fix. Rather than shaming yourself for it, try to be really, really conscious of the fact that you are allowing this behavior to occur. So if I'm eating too much food, I'm sitting there with my bowl of chips. I'm saying, yes, Tom, every chip that I put in my mouth, this is my decision. I'm doing this. I'm doing it. See how truthful you can be with yourself. I'm doing it because I don't want to feel the pain boredom brings. I swear to God, I've seen this happen over and over again. Not only anecdotally, I've read about it. I've seen it with clients. The more consciousness you bring, to the habit, gradually the habit starts to dissipate because you can't, you're not hiding from yourself anymore. The habit is just there to um, blast your brain off into unconscious land so that you don't have to deal with pain. But if you're bringing consciousness back into the behavior, you're allowing yourself to be there. You're really, really aware that you're acting independently. It starts to dissipate because the truth reveals itself over time. I know I'm doing this because I lacked external validation when I was younger. I know I'm doing this because I'm simply bored. I know I'm doing this because it once served as an effective coping strategy from when I was traumatized. It comes up. Consciousness uh, bridges the gap between the mammalian part of the brain and the and the conscious aspect, the, the front part of the brain. It, it really does that. So be really, really conscious of it. This brings me to part three of the podcast, my friends. And I wanted to start off um, talking about addiction and relationships because now that we know that addiction isn't necessarily just of a drug, 
and we should put alcohol in there as well because it's a drug. It's anything that influences the neurochemistry in the brain. So go for your life. Uh, how many drugs are out there? A fucking nice landscape is a drug. <laughs> anything. Now that we know that it, it, it permeates into the relationship field too, we can start to have a think about what people are getting out of in attachment relationships. And if we ever think about that first paragraph that we spoke about, if we are wired to move from negative states to positive states, there is a sense that the person to whom I'm attached to in this relationship is, is doing something for me. Now, in very conscious relationships, in very meaningful, fulfilling relationships, um, there is attachment there as well, but ultimately it's two individuals trying to grow themselves. It just so happens that the relationship augments that process. When in, in attachment relationships, there is a sense whether the individuals recognize it or not, that they can't live without the other person. And, the you know, the worst thing about that is that that phrase could have been taken and, and, and taken out of a, a Hollywood movie or a Disney film. You know, you complete me, says Tom Cruise. And it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful um, romantic idea, I suppose, that it's terrible in the land of psychology, especially for psychological development. What we want in life is to be able to stand on our own two feet and, 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 and mediate the world. And, and, and our inner environment um, with our own skill and our own tools that we possess and we've cultivated over time. And if we can't do that, if we're relying on crutches for support, that's where the work is. That's where our next thing is. You know, people are very interested in this idea around purpose. I need to find my purpose in all this sort of stuff. And I always say to clients, what's directly in front of you? You know, what needs to happen right now? Because there's no point trying to find, you know, the thing that's going to, um, you know, save humankind, you know, from from the brink of disaster. Even though we probably need that right now, um, if you, you know, if you if you have shit to do yourself, you know, if you if you eat too much food at night, which I keep referring to it, it's something I've got to it's got something I've got to work on. Um, if the garden's messy, you know, if your relationships are out of whack, if your, your diet is out of whack, if your mental health is out of whack, you know, and just because you have work to do doesn't mean it's, it's a bad thing. You should be excited. That's the path. That is your purpose right now as it is. So coming back to relationships, what we want to have a think about is the, the process of pain and pleasure. So in the Eastern tradition, they call it the karma. What are the karma cycles? Pain and pleasure. Okay, so you can tell when couples are in this kind of attachment paradigm when they move from states of incredible pleasure and this is my soulmate and we haven't stopped talking and we never fight to pain, 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 worst person in the world, moving out again, abuse verbally, physically, all these things, you know, and what we want to try to do, this is from the Eastern perspective again, is try to get out. If everyone's watching at home, if everyone's just listening, I'm just moving a circle with my head, but we want to try to get out of the wheel, the karma wheel from a Buddhist perspective, moving, constantly trying to get from the pain to the pleasure, from the pain to the pleasure. It's a never ending cycle. We want to step off that wheel and find contentment in the here and now. And the best way to do that is to, I mean, one of the things that's so alluring about these these relationships is that the ecstasy that comes with the pleasure is 10 times the ecstasy and the pleasure that you're going to get from a, a more conscious relationship. But the sacrifice you make for that ecstasy is the fact that the pain is 10 times worse than you're going to get from a more conscious relationship. Okay. So like we were speaking about, when it comes to someone who is snacking too much after dinner, bring consciousness to the the pain pleasure cycle in that relationship. If things are on top, if you guys are going on top of the world right now, make sure you're aware of that. Make sure what you know, what what you're telling yourself is is really really powerful. I know that we're here right now because there is a sense of a lack. If, if I'm not, you know, really start to have those conversations, try to have those conversations with your partners as well and, and do it from a place of, 
you're wrong, not, sorry, do it from a place of, not from a place of you're wrong, but how can we fix this together? After all, it's you two against the problem. It's not you versus me. Okay. So I suppose to summarize guys, when we're thinking about addiction, let's not think of addiction as black and white. Also, let's also have a think about the fact that the person who is using the person, using the substance, partaking that behavior is getting something from it. So we want to have a conversation around what that person is actually getting from it. Because as an example, so many heroin users are really, really struggling from physical pain. Does that mean we should look at heroin and go, heroin's terrible? Or should we look at the individual and say, how can we help you with your pain? Because without the pain, there would be no heroin. So the pain and the drug, they go together, okay? And then they don't, they do not go together like water and oil. They need each other. So if there's no pain, there's no coping strategy. Look at that idea for yourself and have a think about what you are using as a coping strategy. And then, because it's a sim, it's a band-aid, you know. Then how can you transcend the pain. And the first step is to, as we said, number three, bring more consciousness to the pain. Understand the pain. Understand its 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 genesis, its origins. Understand how it's currently um, you know, reliving itself in the present and, and what you can do then to 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 put a stop to that. And speak to people. There are so many people out there that have have, have done what you're trying to do. You know, there are so many people out there that, you know, if you might be at day one or day 10, people are at day 1050 and they really can help you with that. So guys, that was my little rant on addiction. (laughs) Uh, I hope it has uh, illumined some stuff from the darkness. And, um, you know, I think one thing you can remember, we're all in this together. We're all trying to figure this out, this thing called life. And if you know something that I don't, or if I know something that you don't, I think it is our our absolute uh, dire need, especially in this time, to provide that knowledge uh, because it's important. And as it shows, for two million years, we have evolved um, socially. We need each other. All right, guys. Cheers. Hey, guys. If you enjoyed the content, uh, you are more than welcome to click the link in the description below. That will take you right to a free webinar where I will be taking you exactly through how to design a framework for your life and create that mission that will bring about a sense of intrinsic value to you. Go for it.